Okay, I have a, a note. Dear Pastor Steve and Church, and God is able to make all grace abound to, to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Greetings in the matchless name of Jesus. I'd like to express my gratitude to you all for not only for praying for us, but also for sending money to meet the needs of the people. Fourteen families will receive food. Thank you. Famine is still doing its course in Haiti. The Lord God continues to provide for his people through people like you. Thank you for your obedience. We thank the Lord for the gratitude of the beneficiaries. They are very grateful. The situation in Haiti is deteriorating every day. Kidnapping is also taking place in public. There's no one to stop them. But believe it or not, gangs are still doing kidnappings who have relatives in the U.S. So they know because they know they can uh, get money. People in the government don't even mention insecurities in their speeches. They don't seem to care and they show no concern. So we need to keep our prayers vigilant for the people in Haiti and for those trying to do the good works down there. Let's go before the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we know that through you anything is possible. Thank you, Father, for doing good works through us, letting us be your instruments to be able to touch other lives, to show the love of Jesus to everyone that we meet. Father, it's so good to be able to be in your house, to, to be touched by your Holy Spirit, to hear, to get strength from your words, to be able to, it's just such a blessing, Father, to be able to be called a child of God, to know that you have everything under control everything in your time and you only want the best for us so father just it's such a blessing and a comfort to know that you have us in your hands father we ask for your blessings on the service touch pastor steve with your words that he might bring them to us and let your holy spirit touch each and every one of us father we give you praise we give you glory in jesus name amen if you would stand, we will worship. You 
stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid because I know. Stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid because I know that. to the sky Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains Your justice flows like the ocean's to the sky Your righteousness is like the mighty mountain Your justice flows just like the ocean's tide And I will
reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. faithfulness here there is no shadow of turning in you may your spirit rest on your people and may our worship our prayers our our thoughts and all be focused on you and may you be blessed this morning we pray this in jesus mighty name amen amen if you remain standing please i have this um <clears throat> our youth pastor down in Bethel would call this a state-of-the-art flip phone. <laughs> but nobody's going to hack this, right? But I noticed this week that I wasn't getting any calls on it. I would get a voicemail, and it would do a little fairy dust thing, a little sound to tell me I got a voicemail, but it wouldn't ring. So um, I got on the phone and got a hold of tech people. Well, I was actually a robot. <laughs> And they wanted to walk me through all the troubleshooting steps, and I'd already done the basic ones. But, uh, and then this phone isn't smart enough to do the, the ones that were more involved. Um, so finally, it, it asked if I wanted to talk to a service person, I, and I said, yeah, yes. The robot said it would be an 11 minute wait, but they could give me a code, and they could call me back when my time was coming up. <laughs> I said, call me back? That's what I called you about to start with. The, the thing won't work. <laughs> it doesn't ring in. So I did what a lot of people would do. I hung up the phone, looked at it, and flung it. Whoop. Try that again. Oh, okay, we're not plugged in. So anyway, flung it. I threw it all the way across the room at, at a couch, not at the wall. It didn't even it hit the bottom of the couch, and it was laying there on the floor, and I kept an eye on it. <laughs> kept an eye on it, and then I noticed the little window on it lit up. And I thought, oh, something happened. Got up, walked over there, and I thought maybe I got a text or something. It said, update complete. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew that's how you fix phones <laughs> and updated them? <laughs> I mean, we can get terribly frustrated with call centers, robots, just other people in general we can get frustrated with. We live in a society that has more and more issues coming at us. The price of eggs, breads, gas, college, hospitals, it just keeps going on and on. We are generally a people that are on edge a lot of the time. But we need to step back and we need to ask ourselves, well, is there anything in the Bible that, that can help me with this frustration? In 2022, well, actually there is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, that there are things in our lives that, that give us a variety. <laughs> and sometimes that variety is frustrating. We like stability. We like the status quo. But you put people in our paths that will challenge us and challenge our walk. Sometimes when we think we're doing really well, you put someone right there that's just a pothole in our road to life. Continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit and your words, truth, and give us the ability to show grace. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to take the pastor privilege this week and jump ahead to chapter 12, the books, of letters to the Roman church. We've, uh, we're only actually about the fourth chapter, but I'm going to skip ahead to 12. I think with the events coming up today and tomorrow, it may be of some interest. If you've read this letter, you may notice that in the first part, Paul's talking about doctrine, about what we believe, how Jesus delivered people from their sins, and that the, the law was no longer required for salvation. That's a simplified and probably insufficient explanation, but we'll go with that. And then in and around chapter 12, Paul gets into the activity, the actual doing 
of the believer, the Jewish and Gentile believers. After all, what good is doctrine if no one puts it to use, right? You can put together all the employee handbooks you want, but if no one follows them, then you've wasted a lot of paper. So Paul, Paul's transitioning to the part to, where he writes, okay, okay, I've told you Christians what to believe and how to believe, and now it's time to act on what you know. So let's get started on chapter 12 from the letter to Romans. Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Now Paul isn't saying we have to put our bodies on the altar and sacrifice ourselves. That's what almost all the religions of the day would do, the Jewish and pagan religions. They, they would take animals and sacrifice them on the altar. The difference is those, those animals were living, but then they were slaughtered and and placed up for a sacrifice. Paul says that we're to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, so we don't have to kill ourselves to do this. By a living sacrifice, we are worship. We are in service that will be holy and pleasing to God. So what does Paul mean by that? Well, we'll use Dawson as an example. As he's Dad said we're, he was inducted into the Marine Corps last Monday. He will be the government's property until he is discharged. Hmm. Everything he will do from last Monday until that time should be to please the Marines and our government. We've had several here who have served, and I appreciate you, in the military, and I think that they would probably agree with the basics of that statement. The only time you have to yourself is never even really for yourself. You can always be called up or called back for an emergency, even if you're on leave, whether the situation is real or it's imagined. So what if we presented ourselves to God in that same fashion, except it won't be for two or four or six, 20 years or so? It's from now until the time we go home to be with Jesus. Everything we do or say will reflect on how much we love God. Are we available to God 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year? That is the living sacrifice that Paul is talking about. It's giving up of ourselves, our wants, our desires, and seeking God and what He wants and what He desires with us and from us. And I think we can find out what His wants and desires are from His Word. There aren't any secrets in there that we have to ferret out. A simple reading of the first chapter of Isaiah would be clear enough to, to just get us started. So let me show that to you. It's from God speaking to Israel through the prophet Isaiah. And we'll just do two ver a couple verses, 15. And it says, When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. God doesn't want animal sacrifices to fulfill our obligation to Him. He wants us, mind, body, and soul. See, we are His. And because His Son, Jesus, has paid the price to redeem us from sin, the least, the least that we could do is be grateful and do all that we can, as much as we can, for Him and for others. Remember, He doesn't need us. We need Him, though. So let's look at verse 2 of chapter 12. This is going to be a, a slow study, isn't it? Do not conform, Paul says, any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. It takes a renewing of our minds to be able to live that out. This is a, a new concept for these Christians in Rome. It's a transformation of their habits and lifestyle, the culture that they lived in. And yes, Paul's words are as important to us in 2022 as it was to them back in the first century. We can't, we can't live in two worlds and say we belong to God and yet do the things the non-believer does. 
That's a double-minded person, one who will be swallowed up by the world. Well, they say, Lord, Lord, but Jesus says they didn't really know him. Christians need to be transformed, conformed to the will of God. To do that, they will need to be broken. Kind of like a, when you break a wild horse, they have their will changed to be formed in the likeness of Jesus. Christians need to do their best to seek God's will in all that they do. For they are his representatives here on earth. We talked last week about the failure of the Jews to share God to the other nations. And Christians should be mindful of that failure. Paul continues, For by the grace given me I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgments in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Let me pause there a second. Paul says Christians not only belong to God, but now the Christian, they belong to each other. We belong to other Christians in order to, to form a whole body. That is imagery that Paul uses many times in, the, in his letters, that the church is the body of Christ. If other people have control over what I do or say, or at least have some input over what I do or say, then I just might be more careful in my speech and my actions. Not only do my actions reflect on God, but now I know that they reflect on other Christians. Now, how often have you heard it said, well, they call themselves Christians, but did you see how they were out drinking and cussing and carousing and so on the other night? They're all a bunch of hypocrites, if you ask me. Well, maybe you've put it in another perspective. Maybe you've had a relative that was a black sheep of the family, and you met someone, and they heard your last name, and, and they knew this black sheep, and they said, well, oh, are you related to this person? Did we jump up and say, yeah, that's, you want to claim them? And all that they've done? Because meeting somebody, that's going to reflect on you. It happens. As Christians, we're now part of another family, a family of God. All Christians are part of the body of Christ. And sure, there will be some who are the blisters, maybe an ir irritation to us. But don't forget that, that blisters can turn into calluses and, and maybe some of the toughest parts of the body. So once they become a callus, they can go on to help others in the areas that they've struggled with and overcome victoriously in life. So pray for the Christian who's still trying to be transformed from a blister into a callus. The blister is aggravating and frustrating. But the callus is there to show they, they've won through. They have gained control. They are hardened and ready to go into battle. Let's read on. Paul says, We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Talked about this before. These gifts, their gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. They aren't something that can be bought. They are given to the Christian just like grace has been given to the Christian. It's a free gift. What is it they say? With much power comes much responsibility. With spiritual gifts of the Christian, Paul says to serve, to encourage, to contribute generously in leading others and showing mercy and doing so with a good heart, not grudgingly. In other words, use your gifts to build one another up. That the church that you serve, you support. And you serve it as you serve Christ. This leads us to this next part. Love must be sincere. 
Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. You honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Love must be sincere, genuine, and authentic. Have you ever tried to hug a, a stiff kid? If they don't want you to hug them, then they just stiffen up. They don't reciprocate. Maybe Paul's saying that Christians have to be pliable in their ability to love. We have to relax. Nevertheless, they are to be discerning in what and how they love. The only thing God hates are sin and evil. We should be the same. We are to gravitate and elevate those things that are good, whether they be actions or people. And as with the gifts that were given, Christians are to be devoted to one another, being obligated for their well-being, to encourage and to lift them up, honoring them more than themselves, and to love them. Paul continues to remind the reader that they are serving the Lord and should do so with all the gusto and enthusiasm as we would say, I don't know, some kind of championship football game, like, I don't know, Super Bowl. We are, we should be as excited to serve God as we are to watch and cheer for the Bengals, are we not? Christians should be cheering for one another as, as they meet and tackle the temptations in life and rise above those things that are evil and cherish what is good to support one another in the times of loss and hurt and pain. The Christian must be joyous, hopeful, and patient when time gets hard, but always, always be faithful in prayer. You know that we have a phone tree prayer chain and, a, and an email prayer chain at this church. Now, I've seen people on Facebook say, well, I'll pray for you. And I often wonder, well, I've seen your other posts. You don't seem like the praying type. So I say, well, will they really pray? Well, we know that the people here pray. And oftentimes you'll, you'll think, well, it's not worth praying for. Well, anything that's come up, it's worth praying for. How much more power will we have in our prayers if we join together as one body, praying to the Lord of the universe? There is power in prayer. And I've seen the power of praying people. And then Paul says to share with people in need. Show hospitality. As I've said many times, you all are true givers. I said it just a minute ago. You've shared with the people in Haiti. That was Pastor Pierre's thank you note that David read. You shared in person. You've gone to Haiti. And you continue to share monetarily. You've shared with the women's shelter and back to school bonanza, the Matthew 25, Operation Christmas Child, the disabled American veterans of Bernie's Place, Redbird Mission, which we're doing now, and, and the Global Smile Foundation, who works with kids in foreign countries with cleft palates. And then there's other things that come up that you take care of on your own that's not even involved with the church. Sharing time with working in organizations or projects that you donate your time and money to. I'm proud. Let me tell you, I'm proud to be a pastor here. And I brag on you all the time. You all are practicing hospitality in ways that you're able to. So enough about you. Let's go back to Paul. Paul says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Hmm. Sounds a little bit like Jesus, doesn't it? Of course it does. Remind you again, read that Sermon on the Mount. It's in the Gospel of Matthew, if you don't know, from chapters 5 through 7. Maybe read a chapter a day. It's three days. 
Doesn't take that long, but think about it. Read it slow. Don't read it fast. If you don't have that much time, read chapter 6 in the Gospel of Luke, starting with uh, verse 17. A shortened version. Jesus has given us the outline of how to live as a Christian in his kingdom. Remember what I said about God not keeping a secret of what he wants and expects from us? This Sermon on the Mount helps fill in some of those blanks or some of those questions. And in case you miss it, Paul reiterates it in his letters, as does Peter and John. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if, if your enemy is hungry, and feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I like this section. Still sounds like Jesus, and it should. But don't forget that the resurrected Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus. That's, that's when Paul started having a change of heart, a transformed heart. He is a living embodiment of this, conforming to Jesus. Paul had been on a mission to destroy the way, the church, this new church that followed Jesus. He had orders to arrest any and all participants. Paul is writing to the church and telling them that they are to forgive all people who have wronged them. Paul had been one of those people. He was vicious and cruel before he met Jesus. And I'm guessing that he only had a few friends before his conversion. He saw Christians as the enemy. Paul now realizes that he, how wrong he was. But this, this wasn't to get forgiveness for himself. This was not a forgive me type of letter. He could now see the better way, the way that Jesus valued people. And that's what he wanted to share with them. I like what he writes in verse 18. I'll underline it for you. If it possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible, as it depends on you. We can't make people like us. I came to that conclusion many years ago. No matter what, I'll tick someone off in the way I phrased something and made a joke about this or that or how I didn't call them back, which, by the way, it could be a problem with the phone. <laughs> There are multiple, multiple things that are overt, subtle, that will cause a rift between individuals or groups or nations. So it's incumbent upon us to do our best not to instigate any quarrels or disputes and try to, if we see something wrong, to try to make that up quickly. We're to live at peace with all people. We do our best to remedy any slight someone feels, but, but then it's on them. We can't make them like us. It's on them, on whether they accept our apology or whatever action we've taken. We've done our part. Again, I said it many times, we can't condemn anyone. That, that job is the, the Lord's. That line say, uh, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. Let the Lord have his wrath. When we judge a person, we're making ourselves superior to that person. And we're not. Really, we're not. This type of judging is condemning them, damning them. That's not to say that we can't make a judgment in a court proceeding. There are consequences to our actions that are immoral and unlawful, and those have to be dealt with. That's why we have laws. But the law determines their sentence, their condemnation, their, their judgment, not the Christian. However, the Christians don't have the corner on all things perfect, trust me. Christians can have just as much trouble and issues in their lives as the next person. So we can't elevate ourselves above someone else. What we see in a moment of rage may stem from a, a daughter who has, has run away that the parents aren't talking about. It could be a grandchild who just overdosed a couple days before. Or maybe a spouse who was in a car wreck and totaled a car. Maybe the spouse is in the hospital. 
See, we make judgments about people without knowing all the peripheral things that are going on around in their lives. Let God make those judgments. Just pray for them, because that may be us the next time. Christians can be discerning. We should know what God's Word and the teaching of Jesus and the apostles are. That should be foundational. They're written down someplace. I'm sure you can find it. Those words are our handbook, our guidebook. And we can see if something lines up with them or not based on those words he's given us. So remember to give grace to all. And if they're truly your enemy, then by all means, bless them. I remember when I was working for Claremont Senior Services, I delivered Meals on Wheels. And we had an older lady, not as old as I think of now, but, and we tell her, says, now when you go out there, you be nice. You, you, uh, you be nice to those people and that you're driving around because that's usually when you got hassled. Oh, she says, I bless them all day long. God bless them. <laughs> okay, well, we're working on it. <laughs> we are a work in progress. Have you ever been angry with someone, but they wouldn't argue back with you? How frustrating is that? I've seen it happen. A person berates a, a sales clerk or a waitress, and the, the clerk or waitress just drops their head and lets them yell at them. You know, that oftentimes makes the angry person look really bad to everyone that's standing around them. And they'd, they'd almost wish that, you know, someone would come along and slap the silliness out of them. I know. I've been that person long ago, and I think only once. And I wasn't raised that way, to be angry at people that are serving you. But here again, there were extenuating circumstances that sent me over the top that day. And I took it out on the sales clerks. So what if when we have an enemy, we pray for them? We pray for them instead of trying to get back or trying to get even with them. Maybe that's what's going on when those waitresses drop their heads as they're being demeaned. You know, the Christian will win in the long run and maybe even win a person to Christ in the process. So we pray in love for them. Love God, love others. It's simple, isn't it? Not always. But we work at it. And we are a work in progress. And we keep working at it. So when you fail... Make a promise to do better next time. Try to make it up to that person. Encourage one another. And, and maybe in the process, we may play a part in gathering more people for the kingdom of God. So may you all love one another, have a blessed Valentine's Day, and be a blessing to all those who know you. Oh, yeah. Who day? If we stand and sing our last song. Brandon and Sharon will lead us. If you need prayer, please come down. I'll pray with you down front. Oh, how he loves you and me. I mean, we have the God of the universe who cares about us and walks with us, and his Holy Spirit has given his son for us. How can we not be joyful? Amen? Amen. 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 Share some of that joy. Some, share some of that love with someone else this week, especially your, your family, but try to find someone else that needs a pick-me-up that needs someone to say, hey, you know, I really like what you did there. May you have a good week. God bless.